Good, good evening, everyone. So as Martin said, uh, I'm Alan Perkins. My day job is head of program for complex infrastructure. Um, well, and what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to share a little bit about national highways, a little bit how we've developed our corporate data strategy, and then I'm going to really get into what have we learned from delivering the A14 that we've then um, progressed across the whole of major projects. Yeah, nearly 100 projects now we're rolling out our data um, activities and then really talk about what's the future what are we looking to include in our future uh, procurements uh, and hopefully that will give you more insight in terms of where we're going from a data perspective so i just want to share a quick video to start with hi i'm nick harris ceo of national highways I want to update you on our exciting plans for the coming year. The pace and scale of change that we're seeing across the highway sector is unprecedented. We've never seen greater. And this year, our focus is on transformation, getting ready for the future and all of this change. We're going to be focusing on harnessing data and technology to deliver safer, greener, smoother roads for all of the drivers and customers using our network. Our strategic road network is a very valuable national asset. It connects all of us with our families and friends. It connects businesses within the country and overseas, but it's also complex. And the bulk of our network was built in the 1960s and 1970s, so it's getting older. So this needs careful stewardship, careful maintenance and asset planning to make sure that we can keep it in the condition that all road users expect. And we're looking to use data to make timely interventions so that we can extend the life of our roads and at the same time, minimize disruption to road users. But let's be clear about this. All of this renewal, maintenance, does mean roadworks. And we already work very hard to minimize the impact of roadworks on everyone using the network and the communities that live alongside our roads. We try to do the work when traffic is lighter, so at weekends or in the evening or at night. So where appropriate, we can close the roads for longer periods, do more work, and overall, where there are suitable diversion routes, this can reduce disruption for everyone. Decarbonisation, of course, is part of everything we do. Last summer, we published our route to net zero, our plan to decarbonise. And we're making great progress on this plan. So we've bought electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles for most of our maintenance staff, our traffic officers, and we've equipped our on-road teams with everything they need to look after the growing number of electric vehicles that are using our roads. We're also taking on the challenge of making maintenance and construction and operation of our roads net zero by 2040. So we're looking at alternatives for uh, concrete, asphalt and steel so that we can achieve this. And looking at the enhancements that we're, we're carrying out to the network, last year we completed seven main schemes, five of which we did early. This year we plan to open a further 12 schemes. But it's the work that we do now that will shape the future of our transport network and our roads so that whatever change lies ahead, the country can continue to rely on all of our roads. So as you, as you can see, if, uh, we've got some huge challenges in, in national highways, but it, yeah, from our CEO downwards, we're, we're very clear that, that unlocking the power of the data that we have is, is, is key to our future delivery. So just some facts and figures about the network we look after. 34% yeah, of all the uh, um, traffic in the country uses the strategic road network that we look after, and 68% of the, the, tra uh, the freight traffic uses the strategic road network. That's where all your Amazon parcels come from. And, and just from a scale perspective, you know, this is the number of assets we need to look after and maintain every year. So having the data that gives us the clue as to 
the status of those assets and when we go and maintain them is absolutely key to us. So National Highways um, is funded on a five year cycle for, from, um, from the government through the Department of, for Transport. In the first five years of National I, I, Highways, we had 15 billion pounds to look after and improve the network. In the, in the current period we're in, which is between 2020 and 2025, yeah, we're at 27.4 billion pounds. And as you can see, some of that spent, 10 billion of that is spent on maintaining the network and 14 billion is spent on capital improvements to the network. And, it, and it's really clear from um, what all the government announcements in the last few weeks and, and the treasury, you know, when we, we're about, we're currently negotiating our funding for the five years beyond 2025, we're not going to get the same amount of money as we had before, but we've still got the same network to look after and maintain. We've still got to deliver the same number of capital projects. So for us, it's a, we have to get more efficient in the way we deliver. Yeah. And, and data is one of those, uh, data and the superpowers associated with it, it's absolutely key to doing that. So I'm going to sh share a bit more about that. So given the, uh, the scale of some of the numbers I've talked about, the, the data we own is really, really, really important. But how, how often do we put that focus on it? How, how much attention does it get? So we started our journey probably three years ago by saying, well, if we treated our data assets the same as our physical assets, what could we learn from that? And how would we get better at maintaining and using that data? So what we did from a uh, company perspective was really to look after, look how, define a, a strategy from how we'd look after our data what do we learn from doing that? And then how do we take that to drive the actions to maintain the network and build the network? So I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but this, this is just the process we went through from, from a corporate level. Uh, and in 2018, our chief data officer, uh, Davin Crowley-Sweet, yeah, we, we did an assessment that said, yeah, if the network, the physical assets on a, the, the network I described earlier is worth 115 billion pounds. If you then multiply that by the, the benefit we gain from looking after that, that gives you a, um, a net benefit of 311 billion pounds. But of that 300, of that 196 billion of intangible value, how much of that is, is the data? How much is the data worth to us? And it was a staggering amount. Of the 196 billion pounds, the data, the data we alone look after is worth 196 billion pounds. But did, did we at the time know that? And did we apply the same care and attention to looking after our data and keeping it in good quality and using it as we did to looking after our roads? No, we didn't. So now we've been, we've been on a journey since then to really look at uh, what are the foundations we needed to lay from a data perspective that enable us to look after it. Uh, and it's really simple, you know, um, we set up an information vision and strategy. Um, we define the data that everybody was using and needing. And then once we got that data sets defined, was it the right quality? Who looked after it? Was it fit for purpose? And then once we've gone through that layer, then it's about making it available to all the decision makers in the organisation. And I, I'm going to show you some examples in a minute of how we've done that in the project world and what a difference is made to our delivery of those projects. And so, so corporately, some of the core things that we're doing, so we've created a, uh, an information management system. So that's all about the rules we look after the data. So everybody, everybody that's um, using the data within a company is compliant with all the rules, is compliant with um, data protection, all that's done as a service that we all plug into. Um, then data as a service is again, rather than each individual project or each individual department with national highways looking after their own data, put it in a place where everybody can access it and pull it down as a service. And we've done that with some of the asset data and we're now starting to look at how we do that with some of the project data. And then uh, part of my learning has been about um, 
how do, how do you use that data? Or how, and how do you learn from it? So, and you've got to learn, sometimes in trying to use that data, you get it wrong. So we created a digital lab to try some things before we put them into the real world. So what does that mean? So again, yeah, there's a couple of quotes here for one from uh, from our chief exec really saying uh, the power of this digital revolution is going to change the way we operate in the next few years. Um, and then um, from Baron Esphere, who, who's our roads minister, you know, can you imagine a world where from our digital models, we know what, what condition the asset is and we go and fix potholes before they come impact to the public. Now, the power is in the data we've got and how do we use that to predict the future and go and do something about it? So we've created, we created a digital roads program that's really split into three key elements, now, digital design and construction, which is what I'm going to talk about our, our whole um, um, journey through project delivery. Then digital operations, which is all about, you know, as I said, how do we maintain the assets we've got and how do we be more um, proactive in fixing those assets? And then you as end customers, how many people now, um, when you're driving the, the network, use Google or Waze to work out where you should be going on a strategic road network as opposed to using your, your TomTom satnav? Now, the world's moved on and customers of our network expect a far greater level of data into their car that's real time and actually gives you information about actually you should leave at this junction and go elsewhere. So as I said before, a um, huge amount of the, the, the net company, uh, the, the UK's freight network uses our network. So here's a quote from one of our, our key um, service providers. Uh, probably not a good one in the current strike situation, but yeah, you know, if you imagine that's DHL or UPS, yeah, Royal Mail are saying to us, yeah, real time, reliable information and advanced information about the, the status of the network and where they route their traffic. As, as you saw, we do a lot of our roadworks overnight, and that's when a lot of the logistics companies do all their movements. So if they can get that data before the guy leaves, leaves the warehouse and the distribution center to now actually, you know, the M6 is closed tonight and they need to go via X, that can save them millions of pounds. So that's the demands we're getting on us from our customers and our users. So we've had to change how we use data and, and create the superpowers that Martin described so eloquently earlier. So when we apply that to just the uh, capital construction projects, you know, we, we're trying to um, come to a world where we do things in a more off, offline, pre-manufactured way, and then we build, build things out offline. On the A14, we took one of the bridges, we built it offline on the side of the carriageway, and then wheeled it in overnight over a weekend closure, whereas typically that would have taken us six or eight weekends of closures. I took down a bridge across the East Coast Main Line railway station at Huntingdon again, would have taken it by traditional methods of doing it, weeks and weeks of disruption. Um, actually, we jacked it up and slid it back over the Christmas period two years ago. So there's lots and lots more ways we've had to think about um, delivering our projects to increase the benefits. So really, now I want to get into the data and the uh, what does it mean to us? You know, I, started, I started in National Highways, I think it was in 2015, really got into this on, on the um, A14 project. Um, A14 project is what was 1.5 billion quid, and I'll share some learning in a minute uh, that we got out of that, which enabled us to deliver eight months early and on budget for a 1.5 billion capital project. That's probably one of the only ones in the government portfolio that did it. And the data and the way we use that data was absolutely key to doing that. We, we've taken that uh, that learning from the A14, we've migrated that across the whole of the complex infrastructure program, which I'll show you, I'll talk about. I've now spent the last six months rolling it out to the whole of our major projects portfolio, which is sort of 78 projects. And now I'm looking at, in our next procurement framework for the next five years, how do we put all that learning in there? How do we get um, the use of data and data superpowers across all of our supply chain? And how do we select people that are 
are on that journey with us rather than just using the data for their own ends and their own companies. It's transformational. As I said, the A14 started 2017. There were seven different companies involved in that delivery of that project. Now, two designers, three, well, four contractors at the beginning. One of them went bus, which was Korean, um, and National Highways. And it started, it started out traditionally like any project does. Everybody's got their own date and they're sharing their own position. We created a platform and a behavior and a contract where everybody was incentivized on open for traffic day and the overall project budget. And it changed the way we operate that project. Instead of having a project meeting where people are going, well, actually, my part's all right. They, we actually start to talk about what's the overall solution. And we started, everybody's data was put in a common place and a common platform that we used. And, and the technology bit's the easy bit. The, the people bit and the behaviors bit is the hard bit. And I'll give you a couple of classic examples in a minute. So this, this is a, just an example of the sort of top level dashboard we used to use at the uh, monthly progress meetings. Uh, and the funniest thing at the beginning was, so all this was live in Power BI, up to date as of yesterday. But the way the industry worked, everybody wanted a printed PDF co copy of the, of the report uh, at, to look at in the management meeting. And you're looking at the tiles going, so why is that one red? Well, you need to look in the detail, but you can't do that on PDF. So we then, we had, we then got to, oh, here's an iPad. And, and then you've got a bunch of construction directors going, how does this iPad work? Um, yeah, but we got to the point where you could turn up at the management meeting, you could look at the tiles, you could drill down into the detail of which section, which trade was not performing. And that was up to date with yesterday's performance. And that, that was absolutely key to us and enable us to beat our open for traffic date and manage that budget. Just another example, um, as, as Nick said in his video, you know, when we build our capital projects, yeah, you know, the roadworks that we do has a massive impact on people. What we started to do was collect the data about where we were getting complaints from. And when you geographically plot that, you can see the clusters and you can see actually where that's related to where we're doing plan works. So we got to a point where actually we were proactively communicating with a geographic community about works we were going to do in that area. And that reduces the level of complaints. What a, what a surprise. But it's using the data then to, to do the so what are we going to do about it to avoid that issue coming up? Uh, another example um, was productivity data. I was chatting to somebody over, over the break about this. Um, again, the key for us was massive project. It was spending 30 million pounds a month, 2 million pounds a day at, at peak. How did we know what was going on and where things were ahead of the curve and behind the curve? Uh, and the value in these dashboards wasn't in the us at the management meeting once a month looking at this data. It's the guys on the ground, the works managers saying, actually, the data shows me what was happening yesterday. We're behind on section four on the drainage, section, section five is ahead of it, or we'll move a gang from A to B. You know, and that's, that's the so what. You know, lots of people produce dashboards, but it's how do you use that to change the behavior? And how do you put it in the hands of the people who can make a difference? It's not me as the project director that needs to know this information because it's too late when I see it. It's the people delivering the project. So what, I did, what did we do then? We, we took the learning that we had from the A14. Uh, and then, you know, as I said before, my, my day job, I'm head of program for complex infrastructure. And this is where some of the big capital projects live within national highways. So we figured I had the A14, uh, lowest hem crossing, which is you know, probably seven, eight billion pounds worth of projects. Yeah. Dig a tunnel under Stonehenge is one of my other projects um, and, and of some others. So it's about how do we take that learning from the A14 and then apply it to the other projects? Well, it's about building that data platform and sharing it. But then how do you get the people and the behavior change that I talked about earlier? Well, actually, that's about not just um, me spouting at it from the leadership level, you've got to get people involved on a day to day basis in your, in your project who have these data skills and have an understanding of the art of the possible. So I, I sponsored 
um, six of my team to do Martin's Project Data Analytics Apprenticeship. And they're all members of the PMO teams embedded in the projects. And they're the ones now coming up saying, actually, Alan, we could do this faster and quicker if we develop the data like this, et cetera. So it's as well as the sort of um, me pushing it top down, you've got, um, and particularly most of these people are sub 30 or 35, with the, they've not, they're not fixated in, this is the way we've always done things. They're going, well, why can't we do it like this? The data is saying we should do, do these things. And it's really shown the art of the possible. So yeah, investing in that skill set with people in the project teams is absolutely key. The other thing we've learned is um, we're not always going to get this right. Yeah, particularly when we specified some of the, the, the dashboards and the data we want. Um, you can spend months gathering requirements from people, weeks and weeks doing UAT, then you deploy it out to people and going, well, that's not what I really wanted. Yeah. So what we've learned is um, get it, get it about 80% right. Get it out with people using it. Let them use it for a month or so, then start to tweak it to what they want. And you get a much quicker um, deployment cycle and you get a much better user uptake of the tool set because they've been, they don't really know what they wanted at the beginning, but now they've seen the power of the data and what they can do. And, and then we've listened to their feedback. They're, they're advocates for it. So really, yeah, fast deployment, listen to the users and turn it around. And, and the best ideas come from the people in the projects. It's not me as project director. You know, I don't know what's going on every day. It, for, my, for me, it's just about harnessing the power of the people out there who, can, who know what's going on and can make a difference. So uh, we created a data platform. It ingests data from uh, a lot of the core systems that probably most, most construction companies are, have got, you know, things like um, CMAR we talked about earlier, P6, you know, um, PRISM for cost. It's all, all standard APIs. Yeah, um, we inject, there's still lots of data out there in spreadsheets. Um, but yeah, ingest it all and put it in a way that project managers and works managers can understand the information in a way that works for them. Yep. Um, one of the key parts of the, uh, this rollout is you've got to sell it to the users. What's in it for them? Yeah, and so we spend a lot of time about um, explaining to people this is going to make your life easier. This is um, will reduce the level of spreadsheets you have to fill in, will reduce the amount of questions you, um, you get asked. I get really frustrated that my PMO teams and project control teams spend 80% of their time look, looking at what happened last month and only 20% of their time looking forward to say, well, the data is telling this, what should we do about it? So we're really trying to change that around automation of the uh, gathering of the data and le the power, leaving the people then to use the do the so what test and what do we do about it? And again, just, yeah, we love dashboards, don't we? But again, it's absolutely the, the so what about it. You know, um, when our projects go for planning permission, we have to go for the development consent order process, which is a huge process, involves thousands of thousands of volumes of data that we have to put in the public domain. Uh, and then we have to go through planning inquiries to get it approved. Well, actually, um, one of the tool sets we developed was just a effectively a simple search page that says, if you wanted to look up a simple, simple uh, look what's happening at this area in the project and where's it referenced in all the documents or what's happening to air quality for location X. Actually, the, the platform enables to do this instead of reading 28 manuals, 28 volumes of A4 manuals, the tool can do it. It's just an intelligent search thing that we built in. So stage one was my A14 learning. learning. We've now pulled that across those projects I talked about. I, I spent the last six months rolling this out across the whole of the um, regional investment programs uh, within national highways. So it's effectively looking at the rest of the portfolio. So that's a collection of um, uh, 77 projects across the country, now using the same data platform, the same reporting. And um, the really funny thing is, yeah, I, as I said, the dashboards are easy. The dashboards collect data from the source systems. The, the challenges around the user education, you know, the amount of times we've gone to project managers saying, here's your dashboard, here's your data, and they go, well, I don't recognize that. 
that's not right. The dashboard's rubbish. Well, actually, the dashboard's not rubbish. Your data in the source systems is incorrect. Or what we found was people were manipulating it. They were taking an extract from the cost database, manipulate it in a spreadsheet, and then creating a PowerPoint report that says, oh, my, my project's all on track. It's perfect. Well, that's not. Not when you look at what's really going on the ground. And what we've done is just make that um, visible to people. So, yeah, you've got to focus on that. You, yeah, the quality of the data and the user education. But it's given us real insight now as to where, where to focus on what projects. And it, yeah, we, you need a common process. You need a, you know, in doing this, I found 13 different ways of doing our month end reporting. And we're all supposed to be doing the same. And our project performance reports were supposed to be comparing apples with apples. Um, but you've got to get the basics right. Um, so we've just we've just um, just rolled this, rolling this out for the for the rest of the, the country, and I'm now looking to work with myself. Eighty percent of the data we get a month in comes from the supply chain. At the minute, we get it on bloody spreadsheets. Yeah, and then we've got an army of cost engineers in the supply chain and in national highways converting the data to from one system to another. But well, that's yeah. How do we get rid of that? So that's the next phase I want now. And as I said earlier, it's just unlocking that power of the data. How do we move from a, a reverse looking what happened last week to how do we take that data and um, predict what's going on in the future? Yeah. Somebody said earlier about lessons learned. Um, so at the end of the year 14, uh, our project controls process says we have to write a lessons learned document. Great, we did. Fantastic Word document that's now sat on a folder in Business Collaborator somewhere. How does that, how do you make that real to other projects? So now we're going, well, actually, we've got five years of quality data from the A14. How do we use that to um, use the data to predict what went well and what didn't and apply that to other projects? That's real lessons learned, not, not a PDF written in a corner. Obviously, to do all this, you've got to do, there's lots of technology bits you need to do behind it. So we're trying to, we are building a, a common data environment, a common model, data model, so this all fits together. Um, our focus today has primarily been on risk, cost, and schedule, but there are lots of other things we're, we're looking at, you know, quality, carbon, <laughs> et cetera. Um, we want to make it an open interface so it, you know, we get that easy sharing of data from us to the supply chain. And, and we want to move this from being a change project to the way we do things. I just wanted to really call out some of the work that the Product Data Analytics Task Force has been doing in their manifesto. You know, I, I'm really encouraged by the companies that have been involved in, uh, with Martin and the team pulling this together. I think the principles are really key, and hopefully you, you will have uh, seen some of those principles through, through the examples I've given and some of the things we're, abs we're absolutely going to pick up in our future procurements, which I'll talk about in a minute. But yeah. You need to, we need to change the way projects are delivered and we need to change the skill sets within the project teams. It's not about having the central data team that do all this. You've got to have the skills within the project team because they're the people that are doing the, the project delivery. So National Highways, big yeah, government org organisation. We have a huge corporate social responsibility. Yeah, for us, what does that really mean? Well, actually, we're all spending your taxpayers' money. So how do we, sh I'm actively working with Joe and the IPA and lots of other government organizations about sharing all the work we've done in National Highways. Yeah. At the end of the day, taxpayers have paid for it, so why wouldn't we just share it with other people? So um, we are really pushing that. You know, we're, not, we're not interested in a, a single supplier solution. We're looking in the power of data and how it all fits together. Uh, rather than get locked in with a single vendor. Yeah, we've, we've gained a lot of insight from our A14 data, but how, if you put that into a, what's called the Construction Data Trust, and we got data from not only all National Highways projects, but lots of other projects across different industries, actually we can use the analytics then to change the way we deliver projects and use that data to predict how we run projects in the future. So really powerful. Yeah, and again, if we do these things in a joined up way via the data community, we can go a lot faster than individual clients or individual suppliers doing their own solutions. 
the power is in all of us working together. Yeah, um, our friend, the the people in the projects with the skills and the um, natural use of data and the ability to think differently is key. Yeah, there are we have a funny um, expression in my team. There are people, there are project directors who are data dinosaurs, and there are some that are on the journey. Uh, and yeah, I'm sure some people know who they are. Um, but yeah, you've got to you've got to have you've got to build up this change journey top down and bottom up. And yeah, unless you highlight the art of the possible, people are never going to change. So just really to finish off, interesting that one of the lines is missing. Um, yes. Um, so we're, I'm involved in the team now specifying how do, how do we procure our delivery contracts for the, for the next five years. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to build in all that learning I just shared and, and put it into the, into, the, into the contracts. And it's really about how do, we, how do we make that pooling of the data for the greater good? That would be part of our um, criteria. How do we, skills within our, data skills within our supply chain and their delivery teams will be absolutely key, key to us. Yeah, we've got, yeah, we're all going to get, government's got less money to spend on capital projects. So we've got to find a more efficient way of deliver, delivering. So we've got to get rid of these um, manual data entries and transfers. And really, I'm, I'm not here to specify what technology to use or um, which suppliers products. I'm looking for people who can work together and share and um, focus on the outputs. So my example is, Early in our life cycle of a roads project, we look at the options. Where where could the road go, and how much could they could could they be? And then we go to we pick a preferred one. We go through planning, and then we deliver it. Wouldn't it be really powerful if at the option stage we could say, what's the most carbon friendly scheme? What's the most cost effective scheme? And actually, we've hooked people in to deliver against that cost and time scale. Yeah, and it's the data that will enable us to unlock that. Uh, and it's, you know, um, I'm not interested on whether it's the designer's fault or the constructor's fault. It's actually how do we all work together to uh, deliver an outcome that's best for the country and the project. And, and just really to, 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 to finalise, what, what have I learned in doing this over the last few years? Yeah, it's absolutely about leadership behaviour. Yeah, you, you've got to, yeah, uh, you've got to get rid of this behaviour of allowing people to say, well, the data's rubbish, so I've, I've manipulated it in a spreadsheet and I've created a PowerPoint. And I've told you what I really want to, you really want to know, as opposed to actually the data saying which projects are working, which ones aren't, and where as a, we, as a leadership, leadership team need to focus. So you've got, you've got to change that behaviour. Um, it's a journey. It's, it's what I've described has taken me five years to do from a single project to a program to a portfolio. Um, Never to be a yeah. Lots of things we've tried in, in the last five years. They've not all worked, but the thing is to learn from that and quickly do it again. Yeah, I've not got all the good ideas. The people delivering the projects have got the good ideas. You've got to give them the skills and show them the art of the possible and the speed of the possible. If we all collaborate and work together, we can do something so far quicker than we can do as an individual client or an individual supplier. So the power is in the working of that community, and yeah, data is part of everybody's role. It's not the data team in the corner. It's everybody in the project needs to have these skills. Everybody throughout the, uh, the, the management chain needs to have these skills. If you can unlock that, we can all deliver projects faster, on time, less carbon, and we're all happy. We'll pay less taxes. Got to be a good answer. So that's my journey. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Does that work? Yeah, great. Um, Alan, thank you. I basically what Alan said and I'm done. <laughs> um, uh, oh, we've got to find out more as well. Find out more there. Um, really what Alan said, and I think the extraordinary thing about what Alan has said is that he's done it. This isn't just talk or ideas or a plan or a roadmap is done it. And 
I can't point to all that many people who have. So Alan, I absolutely applaud you. You're you stand out. You're a rare sort. And I think the thing you've really um, probably because you do it so innately and so naturally, clearly what you've provided for your team is psychological safety and it's trust and empowerment because not exactly it's the environment you've created that's the only way people feel safe to fail safe to share the true data the real story that's the only way and Alan I think because you do it so innately you don't know you're doing it but it's fantastic and the results show so I take my hat off to you I hadn't planned to say that, but I haven't heard that story before. I haven't heard all of that detail of that journey and it's it's outstanding. So uh, thank you for um, bearing with us. <laughs> so I'm Dr. Joe Jolly. I uh, joined the Infrastructure and Projects Authority at the start of October last year. Um, and I'm very privileged, I feel genuinely pri privileged to be leading the Project Futures team from the Infrastructure and Projects Authority. Um, prior to joining the IPA, I was at the Environment Agency for 15 years, delivering the Capital Flood Risk Management Programme, which I always thought was big, but when I see those numbers, it's it not so. But the problems are the same. I think everything, we're all facing the same challenges. We're absolutely all facing the same challenges. So as Alan said, let's try and solve them quicker together. Um, because time is really against us, and I'll come on to that. And um, the, my reason, I, I loved working at the Environment Agency. Um, you don't some, say somewhere 15 years unless you, unless you love it. Um, but my reason for thinking, is there a place that I might be able to make more of a difference it is motivated by what I believe to be, to me, a life well lived. So I've come to understand that the difference that we can make for the planet, through the work we do, every single day, through the choices we make, is profound. And finding the ways to make the best difference I can through the work I do every day, before I die, to me, is a life well lived. So that's why when I saw this role, Project Futures, at the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, a place where I can actually make more difference. And the role was advertised on three key things, sustainability, digital and data, and thought leadership. To my mind, that's psychological safety. That's the understanding, the role that humans play in everything that we do and creating the environment for humans to be at their absolute best. And I thought that's it. Those are the things, we have nothing else. So I'll come on to talk about where we are um, with the Project Futures team and what we are working at right now. Again, this isn't strategies and plans. One thing my fantastic boss, Helen Campbell, said to me when I was applying for the job, I said, what's it all about, this role? And she said, we've got enough plans and roadmaps, Joe. We've got enough strategies, don't need any more. This is about getting stuff done in reality. It's about getting transformation into BAU in the shortest possible time. It's about delivery on the ground. So great. That's I couldn't write a policy if my life depended on it. So what plans and roadmaps have we got then? We've got transforming infrastructure performance and specifically the document that was published a year ago, the roadmap to 2030. If you if you don't know it, uh, please look it up. It is absolutely genius and beautiful. Um, and although it's called infrastructure performance, try not to get too hung up on that. In my mind, this is transforming project delivery because this diagram pretty much sums it all up. So everything that we do every day somehow intervenes, interacts with the natural environment and the built environment to deliver services. So whether it's a hospital makes people better, hopefully, uh, schools educate children. And, and we, we deliver all this through people, through policies, the decisions we make, data, digital. But look what's at the top, societal outcomes. It's the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals. That's what's there as outcomes. It doesn't say pound signs or GDP or even benefit cost. That's what's being described as the outcomes of all projects and programmes. This has been signed off by Treasury and Cabinet Office. I, I think that's huge. I think that's absolutely huge. And 
again, my bold and brilliant director, Helen, is saying we implement this by 2025, Joan. The ethos and how we transform infrastructure performance will be delivered by 2025. And again, I have a bold and brilliant chief exec in Nick Smallwood, who is also championing this all the way. And so why, do, why does any of this matter? Um, uh, and why is time so against us? Um, in 2021, I had the privilege of um, joining a closed meeting with Sir David King, and he talked about the climate emergency. And he, he was describing that not only must we rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as we know, and draw those gases out of the atmosphere at scale, that in itself will not be enough. So even if the if our atmosphere was beautifully clean as of tomorrow, certain climatic systems have already gone beyond a tipping point, for example, the Arctic. Now, every, every summer, more ice melts than can ever refreeze in the winter because of the reducing reflection of the shrinking ice and the absorption of heat by the dark water. So that's why Sir David has set up the Centre for Climate Repair at Cambridge with engineers at Cambridge University to develop ways to refreeze the Arctic. That's the technology that he is developing, uh, marine cloud brightening to try to refreeze the Arctic. This is the scale of the issue. And if you read the McKinsey report from 2021, it was a really, um, I thought it was a really clearly written summary of how climate change impacts us. And they talk about how, it, how it's systemic. So what happens in one part of the world affects another. So it's not necessarily that we're all gonna flood by 2050, but the whole global supply chain is built on maximum profit. It's not built to withstand climatic shocks. So it means medical supplies don't get to your hospitals. It means food doesn't get to your supermarket. The, the whole system breaks down and it's already happening. It happened back in 2017. Puerto Rican storms took out a whole load of basic medical supplies uh, to US hospitals and loads of operations had to be cancelled. It, it's happening, it's here. And we're already locked in to a pretty, to a very different climatic system. We are already locked in. And so that's why Emma Howard Boyd, the former chair at the Environment Agency, gave the speech about adapt or die. Because not only do we have to dramatically improve our environment, we also have to prepare and be resilient for a very different climatic future because we are locked in. So, and, and don't forget, Emma Howard Boyd now is the chair of the Major Projects Association. And she's extraordinary. She comes from a green finance background. She hangs out with Ban Ki-moon. You know, the, these are, this is an extraordinary person who is now the chair of the Major Projects Association. So when you look at the leaders that are aligned across the IPA, the MPA with Andy Murray, um, and the APM with uh, Adam Bodison um, absolutely championing the importance of social value through everything that we do. There's incredible alignment across government and the professional bodies in not only what we need to do through delivery, but how we need to do it. And I don't think that alignment's ever been there quite as strongly. And I don't think the need for change has ever been there quite as strongly as it is now. So. So there's a huge, I think, what, what and what occurred to me, and he, hence the sort of um, my drive and my purpose through through work, is the the nature of the climate emergency being a systemic problem. So of course it needs a systemic solution. That's the only way we're going to tackle it. And I can't think of many things more systemic than project delivery. It, it touches everything everywhere, doesn't it? Around the globe, it's so connected. And yet we know, just as Martin said, it's, it's not where it needs to be, is it? Look at those stats, one in 200 likelihood of a major project delivering on time, cost and quality. We know that the construction industry hasn't improved in productivity for decades. So what is it about that system that, that isn't improving, isn't improving as we need it to and tackle the problems that we're now facing? So how do we want it to be? And this is where data and analytics are absolutely at the core of not only understanding the problem, but providing solutions as well. And it baffles me 
how come, how come we've got smartphones in our hands and sat navs in our car and, and yet we turn up at project delivery, which is kind of like logistics, isn't it? Basically, get to A to B, some things along the way. And what do we do? Open a spreadsheet. Uh, oh, I just, ha and how do we not find that odd? Isn't it odd we don't find it odd? So this is what I'm leading from the IPA. And I do have total support from my director and my chief exec and a real courage to drive a very different way of delivering projects. So how do we want it to be? How do we want data and analytics to fundamentally help us change how we deliver so that we value the human factors in project delivery? So I know I've mentioned it in uh, previous sessions, you might have heard me say it, but you know, I still haven't heard a lessons learned workshop where really the, big, the, the, the reason we nailed it was um, had a great dashboard and a brilliant risk register. It was because of the team, wasn't it? It's because we had each other's back and we trusted each other. But we could, there is data analytics available that we can understand how teams are feeling, their emotions from very simple, a meeting a thing called meeting quality app. You can look it up, you can use it. I, I've got no vested interest in it, but anyone can use it. We can understand how people are feeling long before they might even recognise it themselves or admit it to themselves. And that's that's a real opportunity for a project leader to say, hey, I can see that you're staying really optimistic, but your energy is dropping, so you're burning out. You're beginning to burn out, and I've seen it before you have. We can do that now. And yet, what do we measure? Time, cost and quality. Still. What a lag indicator. And again, unless you have psychological safety in your team, are you going to, is the data true? Do people feel confident and safe to report the data as it is or what they think people want to hear? And of course, we're facing a massive resource challenge, aren't we? It's one of the biggest problems we're facing. Every company and organisation everywhere. And yet we're still doing repetitive tasks. Alan talked about someone every month uploads to a spreadsheet. So we can automate mundane and repetitive tasks. And we can stop doing what we're innately hopeless at as human beings, which is risk management, forecasting, lessons learned. We use data and analytics because as we as we face the biggest challenge of our lifetimes, our existence, the climate emergency, surely we have to create the environment, particularly project delivery professionals, to be at their very creative best. So what do we need? We need space. We need capacity to be creative and we need to stop wasting our times on the things time on the things that we're not good at and this is where data and analytics absolutely releases us from all of these things and helps us to perform better that we drive out waste and drive up productivity through the pooling of data uh, and that we collaborate and again this is the role of the client isn't it what what levers and roles do we have as clients to make sure who owns the data at the moment, we're very poor at specifying this in contracts. So it's very unclear generally who owns the data. And we are hopeless at getting the, the richness and the learning out of data across the whole community, um, across project delivery as a whole. And imagine that every single project delivers benefits far beyond its original stated purpose to the UN SDGs. And again, I could, we're doing it. The thing is, we are doing all of this. Some of it very early days, but it's happening. This isn't pie in the sky. And yet I still hear so much of tackling a problem the way we've always done it. And what again, what I can't fathom is what makes you think that's going to work this time? If we've used the same methodology to tackle a problem again and again and again, and yet I still hear people saying, oh yeah, we're, you know, we've really got to crack it this time. So I know we'll um We'll have a vision and a purpose and we'll get together and we'll do some post-it notes and uh, and then we'll have actions and a roadmap and and then we'll implement it. <laughs> That's always the bit at the end, isn't it? And then we'll implement it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We've been doing that for decades and still we've got the same problem. And I was, let's think about why. We're using the wrong methodology to even understand the problem let alone to understand the solution. And again, this is where data and analytics comes in to help us tackle the problem and even understand it. So Professor Ed, Eddie Obeng, TED Talk, 10 years ago, talked about the world after midnight. And what he described there is, is how the world has changed, is changing exponentially. Uh, technology in particular, um, if people have read Azim's book, it's fascinating. Um, and yet our rate of learning 
hasn't changed. That's the Greek, the, the rate of, sort of change in the world, technology, data, everything is the red line. Uh, our rate of learning is the green line. And the world after midnight is where they cross. So our rate of learning no longer kept up with the rate of change in the world. So no, we can't keep tackling problems the way we always have because it's not working. And so how do we do it then? How do we do it? Um, and <laughs> so I, I get that change can be difficult. Um, maybe we might think, oh, you know, I know, we'll just do what we've all stopped, but we'll do it better this time. It, it doesn't work. We've reached the limit of what we can do, doing it, as, av doing it as we've always done it. We fundamentally need to change how we approach understanding the problem and tackling the problem. And, and at last, driving our performance to a new level in the shortest time possible because the planet's on fire. And we do it by letting go. And we do it by connecting a community. And we're doing it by collaborating on a scale we haven't begun to see yet. And there's a whole community already doing this. And I'm so, so privileged to be a part of it, the Project Data Analytics Task Force and the Project Data Analytics Community have been and are working on exactly this. So this whole concept of how we break down problems using graph databases, using this problem decomposition idea, where say for productivity, productivity is the epic, the problem, looking at the use cases, the user stories, what would be the solution to those problems, and that could be anything. It could be culture, it could be skills, it could be data. And then how do we as a community start divvying those up so that we don't have, as we currently have, about five groups across the community looking at productivity. I love the irony of it, how very unproductive, because we don't know people are doing stuff. It's word, it, it's, it's so dated the way we work, isn't it? It's word of mouth, it's let's have a call. And yet, if I want to find anything out in my own life, I'll Google it. Why haven't I got a project data on this? It's community Google. So why isn't there a graph database of all the stuff that we're doing? Who's doing what where? I want to know who's looking at benefits management. I know. I'll go to the graph database, the project data analytics community, or project delivery community, graph database, and I'll look at who's working on benefits management. Brilliant. I'll connect up. And that's how we learn quicker. We're not going to learn at the rate that Eddie Obeng talks about. The, we're not going to be able to do that. The only way we can do it is by connecting the community. And instead of five groups working on productivity, one works on productivity, one works on benefits management, one works on risk management. Um, and that's how we connect the community. That's how we let go and trust. And it's how data analytics joins up a community and we learn faster together. And of course, this has all got to be accessible in a safe way. That's why we talk about pooling data, not sharing data. It's held securely by a data steward. And again, this is all about driving the, our industry, creating the environment for people to stretch themselves to at their absolute best. So I, I don't want to see this low end, this low commodity end of the project data analytics market. It's low hanging fruit. This is stuff that if any of your teams, including you all, go on the project data analytics apprenticeship, you can do this. You can do this stuff yourself. And if you ever have the joy of speaking to Simon White at Volker Vessels, it's exactly what he did when he turned up at Volker Vessels. He just let go. He gave everyone access to apps and the data and he just let them fly. And then slowly he brought guardrails in but he has transformed the data culture by letting go and letting people operate at that low commodity end of data analytics. And again, this is there is a real problem because unless clients or any organisation has enough understanding and skill around data analytics, you can be sold a lot of stuff and it doesn't move. It doesn't move us on. We still stay bobbling around in that naught to three. And we're not moving our performance up to the high end data analytics, probably the chat GBT, G, GPTs. That's where we want our partners. That's where we want to be incentivizing people to work. 
But we can do that low end stuff ourselves. And a brilliant example is James Garner, senior director at Gleeds, has done the project data analytics apprenticeship, finished with distinction, and that's a senior director at Gleeds. I, I, I will be doing the data analytics apprenticeship myself. I need to know this. There is nobody in the project delivery profession that doesn't need to know enough to the level they're at about project data analytics. It is a core, core skill. And of course, how we pull the data, like I say, that we pool data. But again, this comes back to how do clients create the environment for our delivery partners to be at their very best? But how do we also look after data in a way that we look after every single other asset that we that we have, including our people? So these are the things, these are the things that I'm leading from the Project Futures team um, about how we ultimately value different things, measure different things, make far better use of data and integrate data and analytics through all that we do because we've simply reached the limit of our performance by doing what we've always done. And again, just to demonstrate that this, this is happening, um, again, some at very early stages, but, but back to that point about every single project delivers more than its original stated goals. The Boston Barrier Project at the Environment Agency, um, fantastic engineering scheme just in its own right. But the project team, Bam Nuttall and Mott McDonald's, mapped, and the Environment Agency mapped the benefits that the project delivered in retrospect against the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And they found that many, many of the goals were actually contributed to. So half the design team was, was female, such so contributed to gender equality. And Bam Nuttall uh, recruited people within a 50 mile radius of uh, Boston, which in, is itself quite a deprived part of the UK. So it contributed to more sustainable communities. And, and this was just through choice. This doesn't cost more. This doesn't have to be mandated in every, any kind of project. These are, the, these are the choices we can make. But again, bring it back to data and analytics, we took this very simple um, spreadsheet to a hackathon uh, and we've developed a very simple app that anybody can use to map your project benefits against the UN SDGs. And then in that way, if we're all using the same app, we can learn and we can share and we can help people show the way that this isn't. I think many, many women, uh, many, many, women, many, many people are want to do the best. They say, Joe, I'm, you know, I get it. I've turned my heating down at home. I do my recycling. But when I turn up at my project, I don't know what to do. Where do I start? But imagine we just start sharing the ideas of the choices we can make every day. And again, data and analytics and for the IPA to be hosting this information available for anybody to access and, and sponsoring it in a basically agnostic place for the benefit of all. So that is what we're doing. That is what I'm leading. And that's what I've got full support from my uh, leadership chain to deliver on. And anyone who knows me knows that I can't get through a talk without um, quoting the fabulous Sir James Bevan, our outgoing check chief executive at the Environment Agency. And this, th again, this was from a speech back in 2018. If you, if you ever want to read a great speech, do look up on gov.uk. He's one of the most extraordinary orators I've had the privilege to listen to. And, um, and this was in the conclusion of, um, of his speech, where he said, over the last 200 years, humans have comprehensively demonstrated that they can change the climate. And we've changed it for the worse by doing the wrong things. So now let's show we can change it for the better by doing the right things. And I couldn't agree more. So thank you for listening. There's a big journey to go on. And as Alan said, but but I see I, I'm <laughs> as much as I'm filled with um, frustration and urgency about the need for change, I'm equally filled with optimism and determination that I know we can do it. And, and we will. So thank you very much.